Throughout the 1840s, Americans migrated across the continent of North America to fulfill what many of them believed to be their country's manifest destiny. Thousands were motivated by the promise of rich farmlands and other opportunities to be had in Oregon country on the Pacific coast, prompting them to trek overland through the Great Plains, over the Rockies, and then over the Cascade Mountains to reach the promised land. Their route came to be known as the Oregon Trail, and their chosen vehicles for transporting their lives were known as prairie schooners, or covered wagons. Later in the 1840s, many more pioneers were motivated to branch off of the route to reach California in response to the news of gold in 1848 and 49. One such adventurer was an Illinois farmer and agricultural journalist named Jonathan Peria. Just before his death in 1911, at age 88, Perriam wrote down some of his experiences on the trail to California that I'm sure you'll enjoy. The war with Mexico ended with peace, bringing to the possession of the United States the vast territory of New Mexico and California. The discovery of gold in the valley tributary to the Sacramento and its tributaries caused a sudden rush there from the Atlantic states by way of Cape Horn. And in 1849 and after, a vast immigration across the plains and Rocky Mountains and the desert country east of the Sierra Nevada or California mountains in prairie schooners and by ox, horse, and mule teams. Some learned collegians dubbed the outgoers Argonauts, and the name stuck. They went from all the states of the great Mississippi Valley, from the Great Lakes to Louisiana, but principally from Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, and Missouri. The Great Plains country during that summer was black along the trail leading to the land of gold. The canvas of the covered wagons gleamed white in the sunlight of the cloudless atmosphere, the whole looking from above like a vast serpent extending from horizon to horizon. In February of that year, a party of seven was organized in Chicago. This party was composed originally of Ray Billinghurst, his captain, he being the oldest man of the company, the two Brown brothers, Jimmy Fair, a bellboy from the City Hotel, two young men from Ottawa, Illinois, and myself. Young Fair was staked, that means paid for, by the senior partner of Mosley and McCord, because the happy-faced and intelligent Irish lad had done him good service, and this helping hand was tendered freely by the kind-hearted merchant. In afterlife, this boy became known as James G. Fair, the millionaire mine owner and United States Senator. Our outfit was a specially made wagon, with fellows heavy and wider than common, and with strong tires, also with clamps to serve them in case of severe shrinkage on the desert. The box was so built that it could be caulked watertight if necessary, and all the material was of selected quality. It was built to carry 3,000 pounds, but our load was only 2,000 pounds, principally provisions. The two young men from Ottawa were not partners, but were taken along because strong and athletic, honest and first-rate teamsters. The team was composed of three yoke of selected young and active cattle. They never became foot sore and reached our destination in good condition. The year we started was that of the great ice freshet, when every bridge in Chicago was swept away and the shipping piled up in tangled wrecks. I had been fortunate in finding a first-rate farmer from Ohio, Mr. John Harder, who coming west agreed to run my farm on shares during my absence. We started the last days in March. I had a saddle horse to ride, and we reached Rock Island without special incident, except that the elder of the Brown brothers was taken sick and returned to Chicago. That left us with only six in the party. My riding horse proved unfit, galled easily, and his feet became unsound. I traded him for a Canuck, that is Canadian, pony, a stallion every way except being totally blind. He proved a lucky trade, 
herding with the cattle at night and proving sure-footed by day under a watchful rider. We crossed the Mississippi at Rock Island in a scow worked by two horses, one on each side, in tread power. It was a homely craft, but served the purpose well. Then the great, wild, and almost uninhabited prairies were before us. The air was bland, the grass a good bite, and with light hearts and high hopes, we entered upon, to us, an unknown trail. The illimitable beyond where dwelt the wild red man of the great American desert. That myth of the barbarous but brave hunter and trapper, of the mountain streams or plains, and I remember the lines of the philosophic Pope, so the poor Indian, whose untutored mind, sees God in clouds or hears him in the winds. His soul-proud science never taught him to stray, far as his solar walk or milky way. But over the great mountain tops, when this short life was done, in the far hitherto beyond the mountain tops the wild man sought his slumber heaven. In my boyhood days, when the country east of Lake Michigan was a wilderness of grass, I hunted and fished with the Indians, who returned in the winter, some of them, to their original hunting grounds. I was able to do them favors and asked nothing in return. They taught me how to spearfish through the ice in winter, and more valuable to me, when I became a plains and mountain man, they taught me something of the side language which all Indians understand, and which was once the means of saving my life. These Indians were mostly of the Michigan Potawatomis, who came down the lake in bark canoes in the autumn and in the spring returned the way they came. The Illinois Potawatomis, the Sacs and Foxes, and Winnebagoes were sent to a reservation west of the Missouri on the lower Platte River after the end of the Black Hawk War. But to resume, our journey through Iowa was not eventful. Sometimes, though seldom, we put up at night with a lone pioneer, but as a rule spread our tin at night, cooked our own meals, slept, struck camp after breakfast, and traveled onward. My Canuck pony herded with the cattle and slept regularly with them, and at length all our animals came naturally to camp to rest, a most valuable training for them and to us. We traveled under strict military rules, even while in civilization, the camp was regularly patrolled at night, every man from captain down taking turn, and each man had his allotted daily work. Being possessed of a riding pony, my work was to find a camp and gather fuel for the campfire, not difficult in Iowa, Missouri, and along the lower Platte, when on the Great Plains there being no timber, buffalo chips were not difficult to find. That goodly state, now ridden Iowa, was then known to the Indians as Iowa. At the time I first knew it, it was the home of a noble river called by the furly French voyagers Des Moines. Its affluents are many. The land was rolling prairie, the streams skirted with timber. Now it is one of the greatest agricultural states of the Great West, and its noble river is its people's pride. Illinois was, and is, the prairie state par excellence, with its noble rivers, with almost no marshland, and its gently undulating, rich black soil. Except in the most southern portion, where the Osage Hills cut through it, and where it still has a wealth of valuable timber. Its Indians called themselves Illini, the men, and the white pioneers and their successors have properly inherited the title. It has large cities, with the second greatest city of the Union, its commercial emporium. When the Argonauts tread the trail to California, Chicago was a city of wood. It is now a city of skyscrapers. In 1849, Iowa had but hamlets, far apart, and its hardy settlers were few and far between. It is a pleasant recollection to me to have lived to see the whole growth of the vast prairie land that became the wonder of the civilized world. Not only that, but to have witnessed the most wonderful exodus of the world whose children inherit its wealth. Our original route was to have been from Rock Island to Council Bluffs, and thence through the country north of the Platte River. 
Men who had known the Great Plains advised us to travel along the south bank of the river and cross at the forks of the South and the North Platte. We were fortunate in taking this advice. There were fewer streams to ford, and the grass was better. Hence we deflected our course into Missouri, which was better settled than Iowa, and across the Missouri River at St. Joseph, then a trading mark for the Plains country in Santa Fe. We headed for Fort Kearney, a stockade against the Indians. We were in a wilderness of grass, green as emerald, rising swell beyond swell that seemed like the waves of the ocean, suddenly solidified and anchored fast, illimitable and endless, the whole glowing with gaily colored flowers, fresh from the hand of nature, perfect except for trees which man afterwards planted. We were in free Kansas, bleeding Kansas, and at length Kansas, as one of the most glorious states of the Union, after the curse of human slavery had been swept away forever by the army of the North and West. Among the outfit for the journey was a ten-gallon cask of alcohol, a lamp for burning the fluid, and a sheet of iron stove. It was used for the first time on the journey between St. Joseph and Fort Kearney. At other times we found plenty of buffalo chips, the sun-dried droppings of the buffalo. The alcohol made excellent fuel and the sheet iron stove proved a good investment. As for the alcohol, it met with an accident after we had crossed the Platte River and were well along up the north fork of the river. It came about this wise. Jimmy Fair said to me one night when I came to relieve him on guard, the captain is drinking the alcohol. Had we better not spill it in the grass? We had better spill it, I replied. The captain will be a better man thereby. Come, we will bring it from the wagon and kill the grass with it. It was done, and a lighted match applied. It flamed up, and the rest of the camp turned out. What's up? called out Brown. The alcohol got spilled, and we are keeping it from burning a hole in the ground, I replied. Served it right, said Brown. The two audible boys snickered. The captain said nothing. Jimmy curtly but softly said, It won't do any more mischief anyway. The journey up the Platte was without special event. The streamlets encountered were easily passed. I made excursions to one side occasionally, and good camping places were found. Sometimes I waded out in the shallow river to an island in search of willow sticks for firing. At length one day we came to a vast mass of what seemed rock in the distance, which we had been told was a landmark known as Courthouse Rock. It certainly did resemble a courthouse in the distance, by a stretch of the imagination. We camped at night with it seemingly but a few miles away. Early the next morning, I started toward the curiosity. I crossed two streamlets and the rock seemed larger but still distant. I was riding, angling from the road, and at length reached the base about ten o'clock. Turning my pony loose to graze, I resolutely began to climb the vast mass, four hundred feet in height, but not especially difficult of ascent, having fissures and shrubs to cling to. At length I reached the top only to find it a bare rocky ridge. The wind was blowing by this time, and it was somewhat difficult to keep my feet. To climb back on the windy side was impossible, but after searching about, I found a fissure that seemed favorable. I commenced the descent, but soon had to discard my boots, which went tumbling down the side to the bottom, so far as I could see, to the ground below. It took me a full hour to scramble and slide down. Clinging to rock fissures and shrubs, my hands bruised, my stockings reduced to tatters, and myself badly blown. I recovered my boots, fortunately, drew them over my bare feet, and reached the camp at dusk. The next day, or the day after, we sighted Chimney Rock. It seemed a vast obelisk in the distance, hundreds of feet high. Jimmy remarked slyly, Another good climb for you, my boy. No thanks, I replied. It is once and out for me. 
But I got even with the boy soon after. It was during a noon halt. Jimmy had been out to find game. He found something else. Rushing back breathlessly, he exclaimed, There's a great big animal over in a hollow, lying down. It is big as an elephant. He has long hair over him, rustling. We all gathered our rifles and, hurrying over, found that the monster was a feather bed that some Argonaut had gotten tired of hauling and had discarded there. The feathers blown from a slit in the covering, slowly rising and falling in the gentle wind, had magnified the object in the eyes of the lad into a monster. After that, when James was relating some escapade of his, we had only to say, feathers. He would reply, oh, everything ain't feathers. Soon after this, as I was riding along the trail one afternoon, some way off from the track to escape the dust, there came up with me a man riding a stout Mustang, with two laden mules following. We passed the time of day, and in conversation he related that he was loitering along, waiting for Colonel Loring's regiment of cavalry, which he was expecting to guide into Oregon, from the trail on the Sweetwater River, where it branched off. Ah, I said, that is a good luck to us. We are light as to load. Throw your mules' load into our wagon and camp with us along the way. Our boys are good company and will be more than glad of yours. Very good, he replied. Perhaps I can help provision you with fresh meat while I stay. He was a man of excellent address, the son of a physician of Rochester, New York, and was just returning from a visit there. We spent a good many happy days together, and he was of much use to us as an expert in the plainsman's ways. If you are liable to attack, he told us, keep close to your wagons and don't waste powder. You are keeping military guard, I see. That is good. If you must fight, wait until the enemy is close by, and then shoot carefully to kill. The Sioux are now peaceful, and Colonel Loring will keep them so. If attacked by a straggling band, keep cool. Hold the bullet in your gun as long as possible, and then shoot and charge back on them with your revolver and buoy. I see you have a good one. One day we were riding along looking for game. A plains white wolf was seen. Wilcox, in a low voice, said, You ride along slowly. Perhaps I can get him with the lariat. At any rate, the rifle will fetch him. I started on. Wilcox failed with the lariat, and the race was on. Wilcox trying to head him toward me. I urged my horse down the slope at his best trotting speed, and in my excitement forgot to check him as a caution. And when we struck the valley, down went the pony on his knees, and I went sailing over his head, the pony ending over on me, striking the ground so that I lay between his neck and the high pommel of my Spanish saddle. I was up in a moment, unhurt, except being bruised. The pony was lying still. Wilcox was coming up racing, smiling. What were you laughing at, I demanded. Oh, pardon me, he said, but I could not help it. The pony going down with his head in the ground, and you flying in the air, and the pony somersaulting on you. When I saw you spring up unhurt, the fit to laugh came upon me. It really was hysterical. I must laugh or burst. But come, let us look to the pony. He was lying with his limbs and neck outstretched, breathing easily. We helped him up, and he shook himself, seeming unhurt. Come, said Wilcox. Let us get to camp. And we got. The next morning, one of the Ottawa boys asked me to break in one of the mules. I looked at Wilcox, and he nodded. I had said earlier that I could ride anything that wore hooves and was caught fast. I turned to Wilcox and said, Lend me your saddle and spurs, and I will ride them, if you will hold the mule until I get a leg over him. His saddle had a hair girth, and the spurs would be hooked therein to hold a man if the animal bucked. All right, replied Wilcox. I will hold the mule. A lariat was thrown over the mule's neck. He was saddled and bridled. Wilcox took him by the head, holding his sombrero, covering the mule's sight for me. 
I put my foot in the stirrups and had partly thrown my right leg into the saddle when Wilcox let go. Instead of bucking, the mule whirled about, not from, but towards me, thus helping me to mount. In an instant, I was in the saddle, upright, the spurs caught in the girth, and the gaffs of the spurs were thrust into his flanks. The mule first squatted and then bounced straight away. I guided him about two miles in a circle and returned him to camp, trembling and dripping with sweat and blood. Dismounting, I said. That mule is broke to ride, I guess. Yes, replied Wilcox. I think that mule is broken down. Nonsense, I replied. The mule is only blown. Why did you let go? Why, I certainly held on, he said, laughing. Did you expect me to lead him for you? The boys wanted me to ride the other mule. No, I replied. One Texas mule a day is enough. And Wilcox added, I think I prefer the other mule wild. As for the broken-in mule, he was satisfied, too. As for Wilcox, several days later, after the cavalry regiment reached us, he took his place as guide. I afterwards heard, on arriving at Fort Laramie, that an Indian messenger arrived from Oregon, with dispatches for Colonel Loring. This was far up on the Sweetwater River, at the forks of the trail to Oregon. The Indian and Wilcox had known each other, there had been a feud between the guide and the chief of the Indians' tribe and the white man, but was supposed to have been settled. The Indians seemed delighted to meet the guide once more. They were talking amicably together in the Indian language when the Indian asked to see the revolver of the scout and guide. Without question, it was handed over. He turned it on Wilcox, killed him, and also wounded a soldier who rushed at him at the crack of the pistol and bounded away. There was a popping of revolvers as he held for a thicket of brush some distance away. Just as he neared the thicket, a sergeant brought him down with his carbine. As the gun spoke, the red man leaped into the air and fell back dead. It was supposed that the chief with whom the guide had had difficulty had ordered the Indian to murder him. Wilcox, amicable and kind-hearted as a woman, with the courage of a paladin and the loyalty of an honest heart, to die by the hand of a traitorous brute far from his kith and kin. My eyes filled when I heard the recital of the tragedy. I have never forgotten him. His memory will be with me until death. A few days after Wilcox had left us, as before stated, we crossed Plum Creek and I came near getting into trouble myself. It came about as follows. After we broke camp, I mounted my pony as usual and rode for the upland, seeking our possible game, gradually riding alone the prairie land diagonally from the trail. I at length rode beyond the line of sight to the valley, and far away saw what I conjectured to be a party of nine mounted men hunting strayed stock. I spurred along, trotting swiftly to intercept them, they came from behind a range of rock, and one horse had no rider. It flashed upon me that they were Indians. I remembered what my friends had told me about this being neutral ground, and I turned my pony speeding back straight to the valley. There was an Indian yell, and the whole party, nine Indians, turned in full pursuit. In an instant, my heart beat hurriedly. The next, I was cool. My pony had been taught to act by a turn of a check or the reins. The trotting rein would act independently from the curb, and I found that I could outride all but one. That one gained on me. I remember the injunction to hold my fire to the last moment. My pursuer gained slowly but surely until we were not more than twenty rods apart. I touched the curb. The pony gave one leap and stood still, panting. I turned deliberately in the saddle, sighting along the barrel of my rifle. At this, the Indian disappeared from view, with only a part of one leg visible. At the same time, his followers checked their ponies. I had given my pony his breath, and at the signal away, he went, trotting fast. Again, the band followed, but my pursuer waited for them to come up. He feared the white man's rifle. We gathered together, they used their quirts, or whips, and again came on, but could not gain on me, and I was eighty rods away. 
Coming near the edge of the rising ground of the valley, I saw two men in the distance. I gave hello, raising my voice long and drawn out at the end. I spurred towards them, and they coming towards me we met, and looking back the Indians were out of sight. Had it not been for the plainsman's warning to hold my fire, the nine arrow-armed warriors, supposed to be Pawnees, would have been too much for the tenderfoot. We camped that night, as usual, near the bank of the river. The next day we were alarmed early by the trampling thunder of hooves. The prairie was black with great shaggy beasts, moving parallel with the wide but shallow and mighty stream swollen into flood by its affluence above. We moved up quickly to another and larger camp, and together formed a barrier, except on the river side, with our wagons and our cattle safe inside. The men were stationed at regular intervals, with rifle and shotgun, to ward off the shaggy brutes, buffalo of the plains, from the camp. It was late in the afternoon before the rear guard passed, leaving only straggling parties of foot-sore animals to follow. Singularly, not an animal was killed by the fusillade, but the mass of buffalo were never within forty rods of us, having been frightened back by the camps further up the stream. How many hundreds of thousands there were in this migrating mass, it would be useless to conjecture. How it came about that the buffalo were moving so swiftly we discovered two days later. There was an armed camp of, it was said, 5,000 teepees of Sioux Indians between the forks of the South and North Platte, near which we reached at twilight. Here was our advantages against the big companies. We required but a comparatively small patch of grass to feed our animals. They required many acres. While I, as advanced courier, could pick from many, they must sometimes hunt long after we passed the region of flush grass, while I could find a patch to quickly fill the stomachs of our steers. Thus our cattle held their own strength, while those of the large companies lost not only their strength, but with it courage. The next day we crossed the Platte River, treacherous with quicksands unless the team was kept going. Our light load and broad tires served us well. We saw two wagons mired, trying to draw out with double teams. We arrived safely and went into camp, about a mile beyond the crossing. The two mired wagons made the ford safely, but only with hard pulling and much shouting and lashing. With our light wagon and sturdy cattle, we made good progress, while the big companies were not yet ready to break camp. After crossing the Platte River at the junction of the North and South Forks, we camped in the interval between the river and the region of higher country. The next morning, soon after daylight, I turned out for a bath in the waters of the North Platte, cold and clear, coming from the melting snow of the mountains. Coming back to camp, I saw, still far away, a small herd of buffalo crossing the hills toward the North Platte. Mounting my pony, I sped away to intercept them, and found a squad of Indians ahead of me. Knowing myself to be in the Sioux country, I spurred ahead. By spurred, I mean that my heels were pressed close to the flank of the pony, ready for the spurs to act if necessary. Arrived at the North Platte interval, I found the Indians, ten of them, had knocked down two of the buffalo and were skinning the carcasses. I dismounted and calmly tied my pony to the tail of the buffalo, thus indicating that I was one of the hunt. The Indians paid no attention to me, except to eye my blind pony. It was plain to anyone that the animal was totally blind, and to the Indians how he could get over the ground, trotting so swiftly, seemed a mystery. The immigrants began to gather from the near camps. They wanted to buy meat. The Indians warned them away. Having powder and bullets, I selected one and, laying it on my flattened palm, carefully poured from my horn and powder enough to cover it, and tendered it to one of the Indians. He accepted it, silently, and put it away. So I served each one of the party five. 
My pony I had previously disconnected from the tail of the buffalo, and he was standing at ease a short distance away. Then having a considerable plug of tobacco, I divided it into six equal individual parts, one remaining for myself. The other five Indians of the original band were occupied, skinning another buffalo some distance away, and there too the Argonauts were gathered. But they got no meat. One of the Indians was mounted on a superior Mexican Bronco that I recognized as having been ridden by the Indian who had hustled me in the rush a few days before. The Indian selected a good chunk from the hump and hung it on the bow of the pony's saddle. Turning to me and laying his hand on the pony's mane, he said, Medicine. Spreading my uplifted hands to indicate the word great, I answered, Medicine. I then pointed to the Indian's pony, indicating a horse running, and to mine, indicating a horse trotting, and the sign of for two sleeps ago, indicating that he was the Indian that had chased me two days ago. I smiled. The red man grinned. He knew my pony and that I was he whom he had chased. He shook me solemnly by the hand. Each Indian in turn came forward with their meat offering and solemnly shook my hand. The pony was loaded down with meat. I was climbing into the saddle to leave, and my antagonist of two days before uttered, Ugh! I turned to him. He was working at the head of the buffalo. I waited until he had disconnected the tongue. He came forward holding it up as a peace offering. Mucha gracia, I spoke. Wano, replied the Indian, and I rode away to camp at dinner time some miles away. I there learned that there was a camp, said to be of near 5,000 warriors on the warpath, to wipe out the Pawnees on the lower plant. I subsequently learned that a great battle had been fought and the Pawnees completely defeated. I gave notice that I would seek the camp after dinner. My comrades thought me foolish. I knew the blind pony would make good. He had been declared medicine by the red man of the plains and his master, Buena, or Wano. The company went onward toward the setting sun. I rode south toward the great camp of the Sioux of the Rocky Mountain fastnesses. When about a quarter of a mile from camp, I came into full view thereof with its teepees covering the plain and its thousands of ponies herded about a mile away. I had a view that few white men have ever seen. I had also another sight. I encountered forty or fifty squaws. They immediately wailed out a warning cry, and in an instant the vast camp was in commotion, and armed warriors came rushing toward me, the squaws having scattered. I calmly waited the onslaught, my hands spread out, palms up, in token of amity. Fortunately, the Indian of the Spanish Bronco was in the rush. He made a signal, and the warriors halted. A few came forward, and also my friend of the buffalo tongue. The Indian greeted me with how, seized my hand, and signaled me to dismount. I had no arms except my revolver and bowie knife, but I had brought along my old-fashioned powerful spyglass. This I opened up and explained by signs that the boy who had mounted my pony must ride slowly and not leave the camp. Thus we went into camp to the teepee of the, as I supposed, head chief. The chief wanted to see my revolver and bowie knife. Both seemed new to him and apparently he wished to see its work. I signaled that I wanted my pony and when brought a blanket having been spread 30 yards away, I mounted and fired successive shots, each one of which would have put a man out of action. I had become an adept in its use. I asked if none of the Indians understood my language. Yes, was replied, and an Indian was brought in. He was not fluent in English, but I was utterly bad in Indian. But I got him to understand that without me the pony would bring bad luck. They seemed to understand this well enough. I then told them that the white men were traveling far beyond the snow mountains to the great water beyond, the water of the vast Pacific Ocean, and that the pony was our guide. Then the spyglass was asked about. I directed it at the herd on the plain. 
focused it, and handed it to the chief. After some trouble, he found them and returned it with a look that implied that it was not interesting. I turned the glass big end too, handed it to him, and the herd was thrown far back in the distance. Wah! the Indian exclaimed in amazement. He imagined that the glass had magic qualities. It might bring his foes near or far as he desired. He wanted the glass. No, I answered to the interpreter. It would be blind like the pony without me near. I was asked as to the pony. The pony would die, I replied, and bring trouble to the camp. This also seemed satisfactory. I was shown through the camp, and that complete, at its close, an Indian was sent to guide me to camp. As I understood, it was to keep possibly bad Indians from getting possession of me. The camp was reached, we fed the Indian all he could eat, and I gave him a knife, and he went away well satisfied. This concludes Part 1 of the Argonauts Trail. If you've enjoyed this story, would like to hear more like it, and hear how it concludes, be sure to like the video and subscribe to the Inglenook. But until next time, have a good one.